I look out here at, at all of you tonight, as I said, my heart's kind of is really stirred by, uh, by the love of the Lord for all of you. You know, I mean, that happens to me a lot of times. I look out and I know that what I'm feeling for you is not necessarily just coming from me, but it's coming from the heart of God. It's a download. It's something that you feel a flow that comes from being connected to Christ. And you can feel his love and, and uh, that he has for, for all of you guys. And, and, you know, the Lord has done so many wonderful things for us. And we've been talking about those as we've studied about what it means to be in Christ. And, you know, when we come to the Lord and the Lord receives us and, and saves us and delivers us, the Bible says that we are baptized into Christ. Uh, and, you know, when you think about what it's like to be baptized in water, when you are, go into the water, you go all the way under the water, okay? And the water surrounds you. I'll never forget, I got baptized in Israel one time. And there was no one there to baptize me, so the rabbi said, baptize yourself. That's not unusual. And I, I thought of a movie here in the United States that reminded me of that wasn't a really good one. But anyway, uh, where this pastor baptized himself one time. But anyway, uh, he said, lift your feet up off of, the, off of the, ground, the floor of the river so that you can be completely surrounded by God. And you know, when we're baptized into God, that's a picture. It, we go in there and we're completely surrounded by him. And anything that comes against us has to pass through him before it can come to us and interact with us. But because of the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the oneness with God, not only is God surrounding us, but he's also saturated us and he's in us. And so we're like that wash rag that we look like, looked at on that, that one week where you put a wash rag in a bowl of water and it's completely surrounded by the water. But when you pull the wash rag out of the water and you squeeze it, what the water's inside of the rag is well. And that's the way we are. It's a picture of the way we are in Christ. And we've been talking about what that means to us to be in him and living life inside of him. And you know, Jesus himself said when he prayed his high priestly prayer in John 17, when he prayed for his disciples that were with him that day and then prayed for all of you. Did you know Jesus prayed for you on that, that last night there before he went to the cross? He prayed for every single one of you. He said, Father, I want to pray for all of those who will believe because of the word of these 12 that are sitting here. And that, that includes you. And he prayed for you. And his prayer was not that you would join an organization or a group. His prayer was that we would be one. That was his prayer. And you know, I've, I've read that prayer so many times, guys, and I've thought, Lord, how far away in many ways we are from that. But then recently I reread it and I got encouraged because I thought, you know, no prayer of Jesus is going to go unanswered. The father said in Psalm chapter 2, the father said to his son, said, ask of me and I will give you. And, you know, I, I know that God, we're going to see these prayers come to pass and they're real in the spirit as they work out themselves in our lives but it's not enough for you to live with God and him to be out here and you to be over here. The Lord's desire was to be in you so that you and he could be one. And since we all are baptized into that same spirit, then very powerfully, we are all made into one. Even though we are all separate, then the Lord's spirit all brings us together as we live life in him. It's a beautiful thing. And we've studied up to this point three realities of our position in him, of our life in him. And one of those realities that we talked about was predestined success, that when you are in Christ and you have been baptized into him and he is living in you, that God has predestined your success. Now, if you really want to look at this as the way uh, biblically, the way that it is, it is given to us, you have to define what success means from the biblical standpoint. And success in the Bible, if you boil it down to its most fundamental and, and foundational meaning, success is doing the will of God. 
We can do a lot of things, but if, if we don't stand before him one day and, and know that we followed him and did individually in our lives what he wanted us to do with our lives, then no matter what we achieve in this world, we're going to consider our life a failure. Now, some of you, and all of you actually, have great achievements that you're going to see happen to you as you live your life in Christ. Great achievements. And they'll be individual. They'll, they'll be unique to you because God has a unique relationship with you. And, and some of you are going to have great influence with a lot of people, and God's going to put you on a, on a platform where you're, a lot of people are going to be able to hear you. And some of you, God is going to, to, just, to use us in a very localized manner. But both of those are very important. And God has already predetermined when he looked at you, he already said, I will release everything into their life that they need to fulfill my will. So no matter what roadblocks or obstacles you meet down the road, you have to know that God has already determined a long time ago, he's not making this decision on the fly. He's not determining what he's going to do by where you are and by, by what, uh, where, where, what is happening in your life. God determined a long time ago that as you were baptized into him and living in him, he predetermined, predestined that he's going to release everything to you that you need to fulfill the will of God. It's there. And no matter what enemy comes situation through Christ. The second thing we talked about was a predetermined love. For all of you that are in Christ, God's already predetermined to love you. He's already made up his mind how he's going to respond to you and, 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 and through what motive he's going to, to interact with you. And that motive is love. He's not trying to figure that out based upon how your behavior was this week. You know, back, uh, back when I was a young believer, I had been preconditioned in my life by some very significant people in my life when I was young. I had been preconditioned to believe that if my behavior was good, then I got love in return from significant people in my life. But if my behavior wasn't up to snuff, then what would happen usually is I would be sent to my room, if not spanked and then sent to my room, but I would be sent to my room and I was in that room for some amount of time that I had no idea how long it was going to be. It was up to the whim of the person that I had disappointed. And so very quickly, what developed inside of me was this understanding that but guess what? I carried that predisposition into my relationship with him. So when I messed up early on in my walk with Christ, or if I did something wrong, I immediately thought the Lord's backing up from me. He's displeased with me. He's pulling his presence back from me. And I don't know for how long. And I am exiled in this place of aloneness and, a, and abandonment and that that point in time is over. And, it, and you know what happened to me? At the point of time where I felt like I needed the Lord the most, my mind was telling me he wasn't there. Does everybody understand what, I, what I'm saying? Well, it took me a while for the Lord to work in me and heal me and deliver me from that to let me know that's not the way he interacts with us at all. Okay? God loves you whether you do everything right or whether you don't. He loves you. God loves sinners. He loves them. And God loves you as his child. And I had to get free from all of that and realize that one of the times the Lord was, I felt the Lord the closest to me was when I messed up, when I did things wrong. And then I could run to the Lord. I could open my heart to him and I could say, God, I'm sorry. And the Lord was there. He was there to help me 
and to, to strengthen me and to forgive me and to impart into me during that. I, all of my life, it felt like I was actually alone and exiled and that things were being pulled back from me rather than imparted to me. So, but the Lord is predetermined to love you guys. And some of you guys, this is hard for you because you're like me and you've been conditioned another way by life. And you're going to have to allow God to break that lie off of you, to heal your wounds, and express himself to you for who he really is. And he loves you. Look at your neighbor and say, he loves you. He does. He can't help himself. He loves you because that's who he is. All right? The third thing was divine liberty. Divine liberty. Boy, I tell you, I don't know about you, but when I came in the Lord, I needed liberty because I, I was bound before then. And you know, God has released liberty into us through the presence of his spirit. And before his spirit can come and live in our lives, we have to accept Christ for who he is. And what he is, is he's our savior. And he's our advocate, but he's our point of atonement. Okay, Jesus actually died to pay the penalty for what we've done wrong and who we've been before we've known him. And so once we've gone through that repentance, that true repentance process, which enters us into his death, then his spirit comes into us and we're raised to walk in a newness of life. And the liberty that's expressed in us is actually the life of Christ living through us. Because we're not free from temptations, right? But we, the power for us to continue to be bound to sin has been broken. And we're free. We're not just free from our sins and free from bondage, but we're free from serving God in some kind of religious, formulistic fashion, and we're free to live with God in a relationship with him. And, and it is just such a beautiful and freeing and wonderful thing that God has given us in the form of divine liberty. I want to look at another uh, reality that we have in Christ tonight, and that's called righteousness. Righteousness. You know, I think this is one of the hardest ones for us to grasp. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, is that we know ourselves. And what I mean by that is we see conflicting motives, desires, thoughts, attitudes, sometimes inside of ourselves. And so the reality of that conflict sometimes that we go through, I think makes, us, makes it very difficult for us to be able to grasp the reality that we're righteous in the Lord. Just for the fact that that conflict exists at times. I think the second reason that it is difficult for us to embrace righteousness is, is very simply because in this world, in this created order that we live in right here, we have nothing that we can point to and say that's perfect and has no flaws and was out without any sin. That is completely righteous. We don't have anything in our orbit that on this plane, in our natural plane that we live in, that we can look at and say that's completely pure. And so it makes it hard, you know, living in that in that reality makes it hard for us to imagine absolute purity. It's difficult. Sometimes we look at a baby and we we see purity in that. But you know, the truth of the matter is, is that baby's living in, in flesh just like we are. And we, at some point in time, it's going to bite its mother or something like that. You know what I mean? It, it, we know even then that that's not, it's not absolute. And the closer you get to God and the more, the longer you live in him, and the more aware that you are becoming of his presence and who he is, the more you see the righteousness of God at times. And boy, when you do, what happens to you? Same thing that happened to Isaiah. When you run into those moments where you run into that, you're like, I've never seen anything like this before. 
never experienced anything that is absolute purity. We were praying here on a Friday night, one of our Friday night prayer times. And while we were, I was sitting there praying, one of those moments happened to me. That the Lord moved in on me, and the first experience that I had with him was his righteousness. And just that knowledge of that absolute purity began to unfold to me, and it, it was a beautiful experience and, and a, a shaky experience as well. And you know that you can't live in that presence of who God really is unless he allows you to. You see what I'm saying? Because I'm not perfect like he is in the sense that he is. And so something has to happen to me and for me for me to be able to, be able to abide in that presence on a continual basis. But Jesus is the only thing in this world that is absolutely righteous. The only thing we ever run into in our lives that is absolute purity. But the good news is, is no matter how difficult this is for us sometimes, the Lord has covered us in his righteousness. That's the good news. Let's start in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. Let's start there. It says this, it says, but now in Christ, that's our position, that's where we live, we are in him, we are one with him, but now in Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's not just a spatial description. Well, some of you lived 100 miles away from the Lord, and now you've been brought to live in the same house with him. That's not necessarily what that's talking about. That's talking about relationally, okay, that we were once separated for him, from him, but now through the blood of Jesus, we've been brought into to union with him. And we may have been far away at one time due to the dominance of the sinful nature, but now in him, through his blood and his resurrection, I am one with him. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. Let's look at an Old Testament scripture that, that kind of describes to us righteousness and us in the same, in the same scripture. It's funny because we sang a song that talked about the robe of righteousness tonight. Isaiah 61, 10 says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. Now, if, that, if somebody's afraid of God and afraid he's going to squash them like a bug, that's not your response. But this, this response flowing out of this, out of this believer, this one who knows that they're in God, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. That's the way it's, it, one of the ways it's spoken to us in the Old Testament. Now let's look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 18, and let's look at a scripture that talks about this in the, in the New Testament. And it says, and having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. You know that word slave is so negative to us, but it's used here to describe the power and the authority that's at work in our lives. When we are free from sin and we live in Christ, we're not slaves to sin anymore. In other words, when you're a slave, you have to do something whether you want to or not. How many of you would sin sometimes even when you didn't want to? Even when your best thought said, I better not do this, or Sometimes even when you said, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to do that, and then the next thing you know, you find out you did it anyway. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's just like that, that's slavery to that. that that's a, revel, a rel, revelation of slavery to the sin nature. But here it says, when you've been set free from that in Christ, then you have the same authority structure working over you and with you to be righteous and to live even in a righteous way. 
so, so powerful. And like I said, sometimes so hard for us to understand. But everybody, let's begin by prophesying it and speaking it over ourselves. Everybody say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. You need to say that often over yourself. And you, you don't need to just think it inside of you. I have found out that there's something powerful by speaking it where your ears can hear it. Speak it where your ears can hear it. Prophesy it to you. Speak the word of God. All of you know the power of the spoken word. You need to exercise that in your own life too. There's times where you don't need to sit and read the Bible silently. You need to sit and read the Bible out loud to yourself because your voice is going forth over your life. Your words are hearing it. And the Bible says faith comes by hearing. Okay? And so you need to speak that and let faith come into you and let that faith connection with the Spirit of God change you into what you're reading on the page. Now, I just got a real simple example. Some of you guys have seen this at some point in time. But I just wanted to give you a little example of what it's like to live in the righteousness of Christ. I sat down the other day at my computer and I typed out a few of the things that I had done and I was before I knew the Lord. And it's just a partial list. So this piece of paper represents my life, right? This is me. And Part of my history and who I am has been, who I am in my history has been written out on this sheet of paper. This is me. It was me. This is who I was. There's no doubt about it because you, could, you didn't have to ask, well, are you really those things? Because you could look at my behavior, my heart, and my actions and say, yes, you're, the evidence follows this. And so the evidence proves who you are. Guys, when I went back and reread this, I shook. Because I couldn't believe how far. I, I'd, when you get in the Lord sometimes, you know, after a while, I couldn't believe how much judgment was hanging over my head when I read this. Idolatry, hatred, sexual sin, theft, murder. Because I, I had killed one of my unborn children. I mean, I paid for it to be aborted. Murder, drunkenness. Abuse, witchcraft. What you say? You were involved in witchcraft, lightly. But what is what's the same thing as witchcraft in the Bible? Rebellion, right? Profanity, wasteful. Just wasting what God had given me. Blasphemer and liar. Those are just a few things I wrote on there. And man, when I went back and looked at that list, it scared me. That's me. That was me. Separated away from the Lord, that was me. But when you come to the Lord, you're baptized into him. So the Lord took my life. And all of those things, you know, through his blood... I don't even, you know, are they part of my history? Yes, but I, they're not even active in my life anymore. You don't even see them. And you say, well, you're not the same size you were. Well, that's good because some of my, fle my flesh needed to die. You know, but, the, but I, when I came to the Lord, when the Lord saved me, he put me into Christ. And there I am. So now, when the Father looks at me, this is what he sees. Okay, the outside is Christ. The envelope represents the righteousness of who he is, the purity of who he is. And so my life was put inside of his life. So when the Father looks at me now, and he relates to me, and he decides what I'm going to get from my inheritance from him, and the things that are going to be given to me and all that, he, all, those things, all those decisions are made through Christ, because I am living inside of him. You see, and now I'm, jo I'm jointly, I'm joined to the Lord. I'm with him. I'm in him. And so when the father relates to me, he relates to me through the Lord. And it's just such a, it's a beautiful and, 
and a powerful thing. Isn't that awesome? And you know, I know it's hard sometimes for us to reconcile our position as being righteous in him with the fact that we sometimes still do things wrong. I know that that can be hard. How can I be righteous when I still do things wrong? Well, you couldn't even fellowship with God without the presence of the righteousness of Christ, much less go to heaven. I, I agree with you on that. But the issue for us, brothers and sisters, is not our perfection. The issue is not our perfection, our perfection of character. The issue is not that. The issue is who is Lord in our lives. That's the issue. And somebody's not really your Lord if you don't follow what they say and do what they say, okay? That's the proof is in the pudding. But it's not, our goal is not necessarily a, to be perfect in character because right now as we all sit here, we all still are growing, maturing, and have faults and flaws, okay? We're not excusing that. We're just saying that's where we are. That's the reality. But my position in him is not, de, de, uh, you know, is not, delineated or determined because of the fact that I never do anything wrong. It's determined because of who's my Lord and who I'm in relationship with. That, that's what it's determined by. Now, if Jesus is your Lord, what are we going to see happen in your life? Well, we're going to see the power of sin begin to be, we're going to see it broken in your life. We're going to see you sin a lot less than you used to. All right, we're going to see that. We're going to see a desire in your heart to serve your master rather than your old master, the flesh and the devil. We're going to see that in you. Because when the Lord is not our Lord, we live in unrestrained sin, right? I mean, we, those things are not happening. So when you're in God, there is a change in desire in your heart and, and your desires begin to be changed and you begin to have a desire to come underneath the Lordship of Christ and be one with Him. Well, you can't change yourself, but God can. And He can work with that desire and it can turn as a, it can act as a spigot to release the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Yes, Lord, do it. I've had people to me come to me and say, how do I change doing some things? I keep doing this, and it's grievous to me, and I don't want to do it, and I know it's not pleasing to God ultimately, or I, I'm not pleasing. That sounds like behavioral. Ultimately, I know the Lord doesn't want this in my life ultimately because it's not good for me. So what, what do I do to change it? I say, do you want to change it? Yes, with all of my heart. I say, well, then let's just pray right now, and let's ask God to change you. No, pastor, I need you to tell me how to get free from this thing. I said, that's how you get free. You say, Lord, I'm at, I, I turn away from this thing. I don't want this anymore in my life. I'm asking you to forgive me of it, and I agree with you that it's going out of my life. I ask you to empower me and break this thing off of me. That's the difference between our religion and a bunch of other religions in the world bunch of other religions in the world, you try to work yourself into change. This is changed by God himself and the impartation of his power and his character and his nature and its revelation in and through your life. And I guarantee you, if you pray that and you mean that and you, you relax and don't believe that God wants to kill you, but he does want to set you free, then you relax and you say, and, and when the enemy comes to you or somebody says, are you still doing this? You can say, not for long. You know, they say, well, why? And you say, well, because I've asked God to get it out of me and he'll get it out of me. Amen. I'm in agreement with him. And, you know, I don't feel bad for where I am because I've asked God to be the Lord in this area. And I know he's going to respond and do it. And one day, I don't know how, only he knows but at some point in time in your life, you're just going to notice it gone. It changed. 
or he may show you something. He may say, step in with this brother, and I'm going to set you free through that. And you may get in with some in a situation that God frees you through that, but I tell you, God will do it. And that's how God does things in people's lives. But it comes through submission to him. And it comes through agreement with him. Because when, we're agree, when we agree with him and we're submissive to him, you can ask anything according to his will and he hears you. And if he hears you, then what does the Bible say? You know. Look at your neighbor and say, you know, not wonder, not hope, not a possibility. You know you have whatsoever you ask. Because it's according to the will of God. And he empowers his will. You don't have to have the power to run his will. He can empower his will in you. Man, I, I, I remember one time I was so beset by fear. After I was born again, I was so beset by fear. Through this certain situation that was going on in my life. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't change that. And I asked the Lord. I remember I was laying in bed one morning, and I said, Lord, I don't like this. And I know that this fear is not revealing that I have faith in you to do this. And I said, therefore, I know you don't want it in my life, and I don't want it in my life. I said, Lord, I can't change it, but I believe you can. And I just spoke the scripture over myself out of, Jane, out of 1 John chapter 4. I said, I know your perfect love will drive this fear out of my life. And I said, I'm asking you to do that. And I'm, I'm releasing myself to you to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, you know what? That day, I didn't feel anything other than some peace from, from talking to the Lord. And I felt a peace from coming into agreement with him. But in a couple of days, I just, one, I just began to notice the fear, the power of the fear had been broken. He can do it instantaneously. He can do it however he wants. But you know what? It was, it was real in me. And he did it. And it came out of submission and agreement to him. Okay, Not me trying to change things in my own strength. And he wasn't put off by the fact that I needed him. He's not put off by the fact that you need him. He's been waiting on you to acknowledge that. Lord, I need you. And he won't reject you because you need him. Yes. Mm. That is good. And he will. And that's, that's a total dependence right. That's a faith thing in God and who he is and his ability. But that's what our life is. But one of the things I'm trying to say about righteousness is God is not put off from the fact that you need him. Okay? That doesn't put him off or turn him off in his relationship with you. So if you're in him and you do sin, if, you, if you're underneath the submission of the Lord, you know what you'll do? You'll truly repent. That's what you'll do. You'll truly repent. And through your repentance, you will grow to be more like Christ in the area you've fallen in or were weak in. And you know what the outcome of that is on a continual basis? It's something called sanctification. What does it mean? What does sanctification mean? Well, in the original language, it means to make holy. So it's taking something that wasn't, and it's changing it. And it's making into, it into something that it wasn't before. It's to make holy, to consecrate, to sanctify, to dedicate, to separate. So when you're set aside as dedicated to God, the Holy Spirit transforms your life to line up with God's word. What did, Jesus talked about it in John 17, 17. 
Jesus said this in, in John 17, 17. He said, sanctify them. He's praying to the Father for all of us. He says, sanctify them according to your truth. And then he says, thy word, your word is truth. So God is working in us continually to change us as we submit to him to be able to live the word of God out of our lives. We're living in righteousness while righteousness is taking over our nature. The best scripture I have found in the Bible to describe what's going on in our lives is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. And I want to read it to you out of the Amplified Bible. This is the best scripture I have found that describes the dual process that we live in on a daily basis as we live with Christ. Okay? For by one offering, what's that one offering? The offering of Jesus. For by the one offering, he has perfected forever and completely cleansed those who are being sanctified, bringing each believer to spiritual maturity. So we live in this amazing place where through the sacrifice of Jesus, we've been perfected forever in him. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see us through the lens of sin. He sees us through the righteousness of Jesus. But while, that, while that's a reality at the same time, the Spirit of God is living in us and with us and couldn't be living in us if it wasn't for that righteousness of Christ. Couldn't be. So that lets you know that the righteousness is working on your behalf. How many of you say, I've got the Holy Spirit living in me? Okay, well, it couldn't be there, David, unless you were covered in the righteousness of the Lord. Because it couldn't, the Holy Spirit couldn't live in that unclean vessel. Couldn't do it. So because you've been imparted the righteousness of Christ, the Holy Spirit's able to come and live inside of you. And while he's there, he's changing you. Sanctifying you. Making you more like your Lord. The word of God. You're becoming living epistles known and read by all men. Oh, man. Thank you, Jesus, for it. So that's the reality of being righteous in Christ. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, it says this. It says, see, it says up next. 1 John 2, 1. Okay, I don't think that's exactly where I'm going. I think there's a scripture before that one. Should be a, ah, oh, that we, we might have missed 1 John 2, 1. Somebody got 1 John 2, 1? Read it out loud, loud. Because that's, that's Hebrews. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Okay, we, the power to be slaves to sin is broken off of us. He said, I wrote all this to let you know you're free. He said, but along the way, as you're growing, as you're living life on this earth, if you do sin, he said, you're not out of the kingdom or exiled to your room. He said, you have an advocate. Now, let me ask you. What is the definition of the word advocate? You're right. Not a prosecutor. An advocate. An advocate is somebody that works on your behalf for your good. So the Lord in your life right now is working for your good. He is an advocate. And when you fall, when you sin, when you, when you don't, when you miss the mark of what the scripture says, when you fall, you're not exiled somewhere. You have an advocate that is there to help you, to reestablish you, to strengthen you, 
and to bring about victory in your life. Isn't that good? So you in a no-lose no situation. You in a good one. Yes. The Redeemer who ends the curse. Now, that's good. Because we, there is a curse upon us, the curse of sin and death, which has been broken. In other words, the power of sin and our history in sin has been broken and doesn't determine how we live from now on and where we're going in the future. The curse of the law, which is I'm trying to live according to my own perfection. My relationship with God is through my perfection. That curse has been broken too. So now you're living in a life-giving oneness relationship with the Lord where he's covered you with his own dispensation, his own righteousness, his own character. In other words, he's got that over you so that he can live in you. And living in you, he is your advocate. And he has a desire to see no curse, whatever it is, determine your destiny. You are free from the curse. Everybody say to yourself, I'm free from the curse. Now the enemy's going to try to discourage you through past failures and current ones. You're not righteous. Look at your behavior. Look at what you just did. And what is your response to such an attack? Well, I just made one up, you know. And, and, and this is something that I would say to the enemy if he came against me and started all that yin yang and based on my behavior and based upon my failures I'd say my righteousness is found in Christ okay it's not a it doesn't originate from my, from my life from my nature it's found in him I have been transformed that's the truth I'm not like I used to be and I am being I probably should have said am and I am being transformed daily by his spirit to be more like him my status in him is not a point of discussion with you. Since you play no role in my change, my salvation, and you could add in my life. And then you just get the hints. You know, you just say, go away. I'm not having a conversation with you about this. I'll talk to the Lord about it, but I won't talk to you. And you know how you can tell the difference between the voice of the Lord and the voice of the enemy? The voice of the enemy will always be condemning. And, the, and what you will sense when he's talking to you about that is that what he's telling you and, and what he's saying to you is pushing you further away from God. Making you feel pushed further away from God. When it's the Lord, he'll tell you the truth about what happened, but you know what he'll say? Come to me, son. Give it to me. Come to me. Come to me with it. Whereas the enemy will try to separate you, God will try to bring you close. All right? That's the difference. It's two kind of people that works with sheep, a shepherd and a butcher. <laughs> and you got to know the difference in the two voices. So who's speaking to you when you hear things? Is it the butcher or the shepherd? Because the Lord already knew you weren't perfect. He already knew that. It's no excuse for doing things wrong all the time in an unrepentant fashion, but he already knew that about you. He knew that you needed him, and he's there as your advocate. Whereas the butcher will come along, he'll point out your failures, he'll put you back under the law, where when you fail, you're separated from God and, and are deserved to be punished. And that's how you'll feel. And if you believe that, then that'll serve as an impetus to cut off some of the fruit of the Spirit flowing through your life, and you'll feel what you believe. 
Feelings ultimately follow beliefs, ultimately. All right, let's finish this up. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, and we're done. For our sake, God made Christ to be sin. That doesn't mean he ever sinned. It means just like the scapegoat did in the Old Testament, the Father laid your sins, okay, and, and, and confessed your sins over his son, and his son died as a sacrifice for them. For our sake, God made Christ to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I could do an Aunt Esther jerk right there, you know. Oh, Lord. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Lord. Isn't that good? Isn't God good? See how much, how, what lengths he went to to bring you in? Do you, can you see that? Is that beginning to be unfolded to you? To even cover you in his own righteousness so he could come live with you knowing that you're not perfected yet? And that's awesome. And that just makes me look at him and say, I love you, you're awesome. Nobody like you. There's pretenders and there's contenders, but there's only one like you. Isn't that right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much for, for everything that you are. Oh, my goodness. How good you are. How good you are. Lord, you're so good. And because you're so good, I, and you've loved me first when I didn't deserve it, and you poured your love on me, Lord, I love you back. I love you back, and I'm grateful for you. I can live without a lot of things in my life, but not you. I can't live without you. Because I've never seen any other love and any other commitment in any other fellowship like yours in this earth. There, oh, there's a lot of great things, but nothing like that. So, Lord, we give you free reign to be who you want to be in our lives and do what you want to do in our lives. Matter of fact, it's our joy to see that happen. I'm so grateful that you have forever covered me in the righteousness of Jesus while I live here on this earth. And, and Lord, I, while I'm here in this, this tent that I live in, you've covered me in the righteousness of God. Lord, I'm righteous in you because of you. And I'm safe in that righteousness. Safe from condemnation, safe from hell. And Lord, I'm thankful that because of that righteousness, your spirit is able to live inside of me and, and commune with me and be God in me in this temple. Lord, I thank you that you never quit working on me. And I'm asking you, don't ever stop working on me. Never. It's my joy for you to keep working on me. And Lord, give me a, a submissive and a repentant heart. Give me the gift of repentance. Help repentance to be my, one of my closest friends. Lord, so that because I need repentance in my life, I know when I do something wrong, I need repentance to be there in me. And Lord, I count it a dear, dear friend. And I say to it, welcome to my life. Stay here live with me. And Father, I just pray that you will receive glory out of me and that when other people look at me, they'll be able to see Jesus living through me. They may be able to recognize me by, by my unique life that I have, but God within me, they'll see the presence of someone else living there. And God, that's the desire of my heart and the joy that I have received from living with you. I'd love everybody to be able to know that. So God, uh, use me as a, a light to people that I come in contact with. 
And Lord, I, again, this is all because of you. You made the way, you provided the way, you are the way. And so we give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 Hey, man, don't forget, it's going to be Holy Week before you know it. So I want you to start thinking about who, who, ask God, God, who do you want me to ask? Because studies have shown that sometimes you can talk to people about coming to church with you, and they'll turn you down all year long, but studies have shown that there are a couple of times of year they're more inclined to say yes to you, and one of those is Easter. So... Go ahead, ask again. If you've asked before and they've told you no, ask again. Knock and keep on knocking. Don't turn them off, but ask one more time. And, uh, and we're going to be praying with you that a lot of people's hearts would be, would be willing to come. And it's not that church is a magic thing, but it's who's in here. And God, we're, we're going to believe that God's going to divinely meet them on that day. Amen? All right, y'all love on each other. Have a good week. We'll see you later.